it's, it's an honour for me to be back, sincerely. So I want to thank you for your welcome to me. And I pray that today we will be blessed by God's word. I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 22. You can turn the Genesis, the first book of the Bible, chapter 22, which is a famous passage, isn't it? Yeah? Yeah. (laughs) Even the children know it. It's a famous passage. It's also... A disturbing passage for many people where God tests Abraham by asking, by commanding him to give up his only son, to sacrifice his only son. It's a crazy thing, isn't it, that God would ask such a thing. Sometimes we can become too familiar with the Bible. We ought to be disturbed by this. This is a shocking passage. It's shocking in the story of Genesis and we need to understand what it means. Before I read it, I'll say that the main message for you from this passage is that God takes very seriously whether or not you trust in him. It's a very serious matter in God's eyes that you trust him that you fear him. I wonder when you search your heart if you really do fear God, if he is the one that you trust or do you trust in yourselves. This is uh, what this passage confronts us with. So I will read from verse 1 to verse 19. It's quite a long passage so you have to pay attention. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son, Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And Abraham said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid on the altar laid his son on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, Behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you 
and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Let me pray before we we go further. Father, this is a difficult passage, Lord. It is amazing, Lord, what you demand of your servant Abraham. And also, Lord, what you demand of us. And I pray, Lord, for each and every person here, young and old, new to the faith, old to the faith, those who are confused, those who are in trials, those who are at peace. Lord, may you speak to us now. And may you grant us faith in your holy name for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, we're going to look at this passage under three headings, okay? To try and understand it. Because it's a difficult one, isn't it? We want to know what does this passage mean? We're going to look at three things, okay? Number one, why did God test Abraham and that one we'll be looking especially at Genesis 21 just before this passage to ask why did God test Abraham with such a terrible thing number two how did Abraham respond to God's command that's from verse 1 to verse 11 and then number three how did the Lord provide from verse 12 to 24 So number one, why did God test Abraham? That's the first question on everyone's lips, isn't it? God is asking Abraham to sacrifice his only son, human sacrifice. Why would God ask Abraham to do such a thing? This seems crazy in our eyes. It seems wrong even to many people. And many people question God when they read this passage. So we need to understand God's purposes behind it. And in order to do that, we need to be un- need to understand the context. Look at if you look at verse 1 of chapter 22. It starts by saying, after these things God tested Abraham. That word after these things is calling your attention to what has happened before. Saying, look, now that these things have happened, now God tested Abraham. You need to understand what has gone before. Chapter 21 is very closely linked to chapter 22. In fact, they are like parallels to each other. But even before chapter 21, you need to understand what is happening in Genesis. I know Pastor has uh, preached recently to you from chapter 6, isn't it? So I know that you are well informed up to that point. But I want to remind you what's happening in Genesis. So, Abraham is first introduced at the end of chapter 11 of Genesis. You can turn to chapter 11. You cannot understand the sacrifice of Isaac unless you understand uh, the promises that God has made to Abraham. So, in chapter 11, we see God's displeasure with humanity when they try to build a tower, the Tower of Babel. And chapter 11 says that they they did this in order to make a name for themselves. And this is a constant sin of humanity, that they want to make a name for ourselves. We are prideful people. We are rebellious people. Ever since the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve turned away from God's command and tried to make their own way. That is the the repetitive sin of humanity. And you can see that in your own heart, isn't it? That often you are conflicted within you. That you want to be the God of your life. You want to decide what's right and wrong. You want to make your own way. You want to make sure of things. That is the sin of humanity. And it's repeated throughout Genesis. As uh, Cain and Abel 
is an example of that. The, the rebellion that led to God's judgment with the flood also speaks to that. And so does the Tower of Babel, that the people were trying to make a name for themselves without God. In fact, making their name against God, that they might reach to the heavens. And this greatly displeases God. So God scatters them. But at the end of chapter 11, we see the introduction of Abraham. And then at chapter 12, we see the Lord calling Abraham. This is a very significant turning point in history. The Lord calls Abraham and renews his promises to him. He makes his promises to Abraham that he will bless him. That God will make his name known through Abraham. That he will give Abraham a people. That he will give Abraham a land. And that Abraham, through Abraham's offspring, he will be a blessing to all the nations. I think Pastor spoke to you about the offspring of God, isn't it? That God had promised to redeem humanity through an offspring of Adam and Eve. And Genesis is following the offspring from Adam to Seth, from Seth to Noah, and now Abraham is a key figure in this offspring. And God has made his promise to him that he will bless the world through Abraham's offspring. It's very important to get this because we see there's a constant tension, isn't there, between mankind wanting to make their own name and God making his name through a particular offspring. So that's where that's the, the calling of Abraham. And you can see, therefore, that the, the calling of an offspring, the, the, the offspring from Abraham is very important, isn't it? That all of Abraham's hopes are tied to his son. When we look at the story of Isaac, we need to understand that all of Abraham's future hopes are tied up in Isaac. Even the hopes of redemption for mankind are linked to Isaac, the son who was promised to Abraham. So Abraham knows that Isaac is a very important figure. And to lose him would be to lose everything. Now, Abraham, just like we are, we are often tempted, isn't it, to make our own way in life. We trust in ourselves, not in God. And Abraham had that same temptation. Do you remember that he tried to uh, make his own son, isn't it, through the slave woman Hagar? Ishmael was an attempt of Abraham and Sarah to get their own son. But God in chapter 17 says, no, you will, Ishmael will not be your heir who will inherit the world. I will provide through Sarah, though she is barren, through Sarah your offspring will be named. God is establishing his promises based upon his own supernatural provision, not upon the works of man. And this is actually what... Uh, this passage is setting up for us when we come to chapter 22. It's a conflict between human agency and divine agency. A conflict between the works of man and the works of God. Where is our hope? Where is our salvation? Genesis is saying it's not in man, but it's in God. It's in the offspring that God has promised. And in chapter 21, we finally see the provision of this promised offspring. Finally, by a miracle, Isaac is born. Isaac is given to God. This is a massive moment. And we see that Moses, who is the writer of Genesis and the first five books of the Bible. He makes a close connection between 
chapter 21 and chapter 22. And I want to show you that. I know this is heavy at the moment. But when you see that, I think it teaches us an important lesson. So notice the parallels between 22 and 21. At the beginning of chapter 21, God gives Isaac to Abraham. Isn't it? At the beginning of chapter 22, God demands Isaac back. That's the first parallel. And then in chapter 21, after that, Abraham is forced to give up Ishmael. In chapter 21, Sarah sees, after Sarah has received Isaac, she sees Ishmael, and she wants Ishmael to be taken away in order that Isaac's inheritance could be established. Sarah saw Ishmael as a threat to Isaac's inheritance. And Abraham is forced to give up his son Ishmael. And it displeases Ishmael. Uh, it dis displeases Abraham. Similarly, in Genesis 22, God is telling Abraham to give up Isaac, even. That Abraham has lost Ishmael. He's only left with Isaac. And then God says, give him up, too. There's another parallel between the two passages. We also see this with the angel of the Lord. In chapter 21, the angel of the Lord appears to Hagar and provides water through a well. Just like in chapter 22, the angel of the Lord also appears, isn't it? To provide a sacrifice for Abraham. So the intervention of the angel. And then also at the end of chapter 21, Abraham makes a covenant with the Philistines in order to secure land for his offspring. And also in chapter 22 at the end, God makes a covenant with Abraham about land and about his future. It's very interesting that it's often you find in the Jewish scriptures that they are very careful with the way they set up their stories. And this is a deliberate parallel. These, these two passages mirror each other. And they are asking us to reflect. Why? Why has Moses set it up this way? What does it mean for us? I think in chapter 21, Abraham gets a taste of God's promises. That finally Abraham is starting to see the promises of God come into place. The promise of offspring, the promise of land, the promise of blessings. He sees the son given to him, isn't it? This is Abraham's thinking. When Isaac comes, Abraham's thinking, yes, finally, I have my son through Sarah. Surely now all the other things will follow. And Abraham is tempted to secure the promises of God by his own strength and by his own wisdom. And we start to see that though in chapter 21, Abraham does get a land from the Philistines and he does get his son, these things are not done by God's agency but by man's. That actually this is, chapter 21 is showing uh, the promises of God trying to be fulfilled by man. And Abraham is very much tempted towards making an idol out of his son, I think. Are we together there? Does that make sense? It's very important that you see that. Again, look into your own heart and you will see that all the time. That as you look into your future, you want to make it happen. As you look at what you hope in, whether your hopes are in uh, a job, whether your hopes are in a family, in having children, in being a, a great mother or a great father, perhaps your hope, you're hoping for a spouse. All of these hopes that you have, you are tempted to seek them by your own understanding. You are tempted to make it happen yourself. 
But God wants his people to be those who trust in him. God wants you to go to him for all of your hopes. He wants you to find your hope in him, not in the things of man. There are many good things that God gives to us, but we are always tempted to make an idol out of them. And I think that that's what's happening with Abraham here. And this is why God goes to such terrible measures by, by telling Abraham to give up his only son, the very thing which he has placed all his hopes on. God says, I want you to offer him to me. God seeks our greatest desires. God seeks our loyalty. He seeks our trust. And that's what Genesis 22 is about. And that's why God is, is testing Abraham, isn't it? We, we learn that in chapter 22. That God is testing Abraham to know if he fears him. So he said, when, when Abraham does go to sacrifice Isaac and the angel intervenes, he says, now I know that you fear me. Now I know that you fear me. That was what the test was about. So, God is testing Abraham. God is testing Abraham's trust in him. Now, we're going to look at number two. How did Abraham respond to this test? And there's much, much, much we can learn from Abraham. So much we can learn from him. How did he respond? There's a repetition three times of the words, Here I am. You notice that? Verse 1 of chapter 2. When God calls Abraham, Abraham responds and says, Here I am. He almost shouts it. It's urgent, isn't it? In verse 2, God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Abraham's response in verse 13, uh, in verse 3, sorry, is that he rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and his two of his young men and his son Isaac. Isn't it amazing that Abraham doesn't question God here? Isn't that incredible? When God asks him to do such a terrible thing, Abraham's response immediately is to say, oh, here I am, and yes, I will do it. Abraham rises early in the morning. Imagine the turmoil within Abraham's heart. That all of his hopes, the son whom he dearly loves, God has asked him to give him up, and he obeys. I think Abraham is very sure that Isaac belongs to God and not to himself. He received Isaac by a miracle. Sarah, who gave birth to Isaac, she was beyond the age of childbearing. Her womb was dead. There was no way she could give birth to a child. But God provided according to his promises. And I'm sure that when Abraham uh, was asked to give up Isaac, he knew that this God gave me Isaac by his own promise, by his own provision. I can trust God with my son. There must be a reason that God is asking me to do this. And indeed, when Isaac asks Abraham about what's happening, that's what Abraham says. If you, turned, if you look at uh, verse 7, Verse 7, so Isaac has gone with Abraham. They're preparing the offering. And Isaac said in verse 7 to his father Abraham, My father, and Abraham said, Here I am, my son. Again, Abraham, he's emotionally present. He's there. Here I am, here I am, here I am. Here I am, my son, he said. Isaac said, Behold, 
the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. It's amazing, isn't it? God has not told him that he will provide yet. Abraham surely cannot be certain that, that Isaac will not be sacrificed. But he has, he has hope, he has, he has faith in God's provision. It's amazing strong faith that he has in God's provision. Abraham said, verse 8, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. That's also a phrase that's repeated three times. They went together. They went together. Isaac and Abraham went together. At this point in verse 8, we see that Isaac doesn't know what's happening, isn't it? But then by verse 9, we read, When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. I can't imagine that Abraham forced Isaac onto that altar. By this time, Isaac is not a child. Isaac is middle-aged, maybe thirties, we reckon. And there's nothing in here that tells us whether or not Isaac was complying with it. But Abraham has gone alone here with Isaac. He's left the servants behind. And I think it'd be very difficult, wouldn't it, to somehow get Isaac onto the wood, especially in his old age. I think Isaac is, is submitting here. Isaac has also seen that the Lord provides. He knows that he is a child of promise. The two of them go together. Abraham and Isaac go together. Abraham has said the Lord will provide. And Isaac amazingly submits to this. This is incredible story. Absolutely incredible. And then the terrible moment comes. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. Abraham right on the brink of doing it. Surely within him his heart is burning. But he knows what God has told him to do. And he's ready to do it. This is incredible faith. We see the last here I am, then what comes next. When Abraham takes up the knife to slaughter his son, verse 11 says, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham! And he said, Here I am! He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your, your son, your only son, from me. Abraham passes the test. He passes the test. How did Abraham pass it? We've talked a bit about it, isn't it? He was, he was present. He was ready for God. Here I am. Here I am. Here I am. He showed great emotional care with his son Isaac. They went together, they went together, they went together. <coughs> he had faith in the Lord's provision. The Lord will provide, he said. This is a man who knew God. Abraham knew God. He knew his character. He knew that God was faithful. That God had was a God who fulfills his promises. Isaac is evidence that God provides. Therefore, he has faith that when God asks him to give Isaac back up to him, he has faith that the Lord will give him back. That's Hebrews chapter 11 interprets this passage for us. When it talks about Abraham, the great man of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, it's verse 17. Hebrews 
Hebrews chapter 11 verse 17. This tells us what Abraham was thinking. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Abraham, in some way, knew that though God had asked him to do this thing, to give this thing up to the Lord, he knew that God would bring him back because God is faithful to his promises. I do believe that for us, for you and for me, there will be many trials in our lives. Some of us have gone through fiery trials. Some of us are going through trials right now. Some of us have trials ahead of us. How will you stand in the trial? How will you persevere through it? If we are to be like Abraham, if we are to pass the test, we need to have confidence in the faithfulness of God. Our God is the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. He's the God of Moses. The God of Israel. And he's the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful to fulfill his promises. He causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Every breath that you take is from the Lord. Your whole life is in his hands. And he has been faithful to you, even that you're sitting here today is a sign of his faithfulness. You may be cold in your heart towards him, but I, I ask you, please, soften your heart. Do not harden your heart against the Lord. He does not abandon his people. He's a faithful God. Our trust in God depends on our knowledge of his character. This is why we are so often told we must know God. We must know Him. And this is what God wants for us. This is why God tests us. It's so that we would come to know Him better. That we would put our trust in Him and not in ourselves. This is what God wants for us. One of my favourite passages in the Bible. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it for you. It's from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23. It says this, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not, let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares the Lord. The Lord delights in his own steadfast love and justice and in his righteousness. And the Lord delights in your delight in him. He delights when you trust him. He delights when you boast about him. But friends, how can you boast about him who you don't know? We need to know God. We live in a time and in the church in Kenya where there is much boasting in man and a very, very low view of God. A very low view of God in our churches. We, we talk about believing in God, but we, we don't talk about the cost. We talk about getting blessings from God, but we don't talk about the trials that we are to go through. Much boasting in man. We equate blessings with wisdom, riches. The, the, the glory of man is what we look at. But the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at your heart. And he wants to know that you fear him. 
can be very painful. I can bear testimony. It's very painful when the Lord asks you to give up something that you love, that you've hoped for. But He, he has your, your goodwill in mind. There's a great message for the Watoto here also. Though I know they cannot understand my English. <laughs> but for, for children, just like you trust in your parents to provide for you, so God wants you to trust in Him. That is it. There are Maybe I'll try this one in Swahili. There are Tukona Wakati times when Wototo Munataka Kitu, Munataka Kitu Sana. Lakini Wazazi Yako Wanasema, Ah, Abana, or Sisai. Sindio. Lakini, Wewe Unataka Sana, Unataka Sahi. Kini Wanasema, Abana, Sisai. Sindio. Lakini, unajua wazazi yako wanajua what's best. How do I say that? Sorry? <laughs> you heard him. Na mungu anafanya the same thing. God knows what's best for you. Times that he says no, Times that he says, not now. Times that he says, never. But he is always there for you. Abraham knew that, and that's what took him through this test. And you need to learn that in your own life. There's often times when we are going through these trials that we are tempted to doubt God. Abraham shows no signs of it here. That is another amazing thing about this passage. We don't see, but surely within him there must be times of doubt. How do we deal with doubt about God's promises? Because I've told you, isn't it? I've told you to put your trust in God, in all things, and not in man. And you will be tempted to doubt him. How do you deal with doubt? It's not an easy thing. I think often doubts come to us a bit like mosquitoes in the night. You know when you are, you are trying to sleep and you have a mosquito and he keeps coming round your ear, isn't it? And you try to get it, you slap yourself on the face, but you miss, isn't it? Then the mosquito goes away for five minutes and you think, ah, now I will sleep and then, then the mosquito comes back. And it keeps coming back, isn't it? And you try to slap. You, maybe the whole night you go like this. And by the morning, when the morning comes, you've not slept at all. That happens to me often. What you need to do when a mosquito gets in your net, it's the only way to do it. You have to get up, switch the light on, find that mosquito, kill it, and then get to sleep. Sindio. <laughs> That's the only way. And it's not nice. Sindio. You know, I'm asleep, I don't want to get up, put the light on. You can be there for 10 minutes looking for this mosquito, trying to slap it. But that's actually how we should deal with doubt, friends. Do not let your doubts fester about God's faithfulness. And God has given you many ways to, to deal with your doubts, just like today. Us coming together, sitting under God's word today. It's a chance for you to kill that mosquito and say, God is faithful. He's the God of Abraham. He provides. He gives back Isaac from the dead. We need to build that into our daily lives even, not just on a Sunday. But when we wake, when we go to bed, we need to be prayerful people. We need to meditate upon the scriptures. We need to grow in our knowledge of God and of his character. And that leads me to the last point of this passage, is that the Lord provides. 
the Lord does indeed provide. As Abraham had faith in his provision, his faith was warranted because the Lord provides. And I want us to look carefully. We see the Lord provides a ram for a burnt offering. God demands sacrifice as an atonement for sin throughout Scripture. That mankind are called to give a sacrifice to God as a way of atonement, as a way of going back into His presence. This shows that we cannot go into God's presence without a sacrifice. And I know you know this. So God tells Abraham to give up Isaac as a sacrifice. As a way of Abraham saying, look, I give all my future to you. And this is a sign of my devotion. But it's also God's demanding of an atonement for sin. And here the Lord provides, right as Abraham's about to slaughter his son, the angel of the Lord appears and, and tells him to stop. And then Abraham looks behind him and he sees a ram. The Lord did indeed provide out of nowhere. And Abraham, in verse 14, calls the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. This is a massive theme in Scripture. Massive theme. And this is a massive text that lays a lot of ground for the sacrificial system that God put in place with Israel. Do you remember in, uh, in the exodus of Israel out of Egypt, on the Passover, God says to Isra the Israelites, to cover your doors with the blood of a firstborn lamb, isn't it? Anyone who does not cover their doors with the blood, their, their firstborn child will be taken from them. Incredible thing. And the Israelites who are reading this passage, remember Moses is giving this to Israel, this, these books. They will know this is an Exodus story. This is a prefiguration of, of the Exodus story that God demands sacrifice as an atonement for sin and that all those who do not have a sacrifice their firstborn will be taken from them judgment will come upon them and indeed this leads us all the way to Jesus Christ that famous passage that we know and love, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever should believe in him will not perish but receive eternal life. Just as God asked Abraham to give his only Son, the Lord provided his only Son. God the Father gives his Son for us. God does not ask us to do something that he himself will not do. Incredible. God does not owe us anything. Everything that we receive from God is his mercy, his grace. And so much as he loved us that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ. Just as Abraham responded to God saying, here I am. So God says to uh, humanity, which is... Deep in sin, God says, here I am. I am a merciful God. And he gives his only son for his people. And even when we see Abraham and Isaac going together, isn't it? That, that theme which is repeated. That also gives us a great picture of the sacrifice of Christ. Jesus did not go to the cross unwillingly. But he went as a, an eternal agreement with the Father to secure the salvation of his people. Jesus gave his life for our sakes. And this is how we know that God loves us. This is God's provision for us. The punishment that we deserved for our sin, 
was laid upon the Son of God who deserved nothing but blessing. He died for our sins. That's the heart of the gospel. And it, it gives us assurance that God indeed does provide. The thing which you need most is salvation. The thing that you need most is forgiveness of your sins against a holy God. Perhaps you're new here today. Perhaps you're, you're really thinking about Christianity and whether or not it's true. This is the heart of the message. That sin that you feel within you, that guilt that you have within you, is the knowledge that you have sinned against a holy God. That God made you for himself. He made you for his glory, not your own. And when you seek your own glory, you, you trample upon the cross of Jesus Christ. So whether, whether you're new here, whether you're old, this is the same message. We must trust in the Lord's provision, which is given to us in Jesus Christ. Moreover, once we have made that initial step of faith in God, we know that trials will come. Again, we need to be sure of God's provision, that he will keep us through our trials. And it's also to know who we are. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That those who have been brought into the family of God are of the same seed as Abraham. That in Jesus Christ, we all belong to God and we are all called to devote our lives to him. That's what God wants of us. And that is our privilege, that is our honour, to give our lives to God, to entrust ourselves to him. We are set apart in Christ for his glory. Outside of Christ, there is no hope. But in him, we live through him. And this is our great, great hope. And I really pray that you will take this to heart. That you will meditate on what this means for you. That you will search your heart. Only you know where you are with God. But if you would trust in him, he will provide his faithful. Let's pray. Father, I pray for your people here today who are gathered. You know them, Lord. You know what is in their hearts. Lord, you know the, the many trials, the sufferings that your people are going through. The pain, the anguish, the loss of loved ones, hopes deferred, much confusion, even anger at times, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would meet with them and that you would grant them great faith, the faith like that of Abraham, who trusted in your provision, who gave up everything, who gave up his greatest hope because he was confident in your promises. And Lord, indeed, we look to Jesus Christ. We look not at ourselves. We take our eyes off ourselves. And we look to him who came for our salvation, who gave up his life to you as a sacrifice that was pleasing in your sight and has provided for our salvation. Lord, may you bless us. May you be with your people. Lord, those who don't know you, may you draw them to yourself. Only you can do that, Lord. And we, we plead with you that you would. And Lord, we pray that we know it's your, it's your great delight that we would delight in you. That we would boast that we know and love you and that we understand you, that we know who you are. That is our great boast and that is your delight. Let us be a people who witness to your great love and provision. And let us follow in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was faithful to the end. In his name we pray.